Why are civil liberties so critically important to a free society? Join Richard Ebelin and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. I'm Jacob Holmberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's Libertarian Angle. The show, as you all know, brings you the principled, uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy within the context of the burning issues of the day. If you're new to FFF, come and visit us at fff.org. Subscribe to our daily FFF daily email publication, which we strive to make the best libertarian commentary page on the internet, subscribe to our YouTube channel, to our monthly journal, and maybe even become a financial supporter of FFF. We'd be most appreciative. And I'm joined as I am every week by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, the distinguished professor of economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, sort of looking distinguished. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> should, should we just keep going on on this distinguished thing? Uh, okay, now what's that book I see back there, Richard Ebeling, for a new liberalism? Right, that's uh, my la la last book that was out a while ago. It's a restatement of the defense for and a bit of the history about classical liberalism, the philosophy of personal freedom, private property, free market, civil liberties, the rule of law, and constitutionally limited government. Uh, that's fantastic. And who's, who published that? That is the American Institute for Economic Research, AIER, uh, for awesome. which I write a weekly article, which uh, very kindly Jacob Hornberger uh, uh, religiously reposts every week so as to uh, share it with uh, FFF's readers. And I also do a monthly article exclusively for FFF in its monthly publication, Future of Freedom, which I have been doing for almost the 30 years of FFF's existence, except for the five years approximately when I was the president of the Foundation for Economic Education. But it is always a pleasure to be working with my old and dear friend. Oh, the feeling is mutual, uh, absolutely. And I I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I, I I hope you gave me credit in this book that you're you know talking about for a new liberalism, given that I taught you everything you know. Viewers and listeners, if you only knew the, the <laughs> troubles, the tribulations, the heartburn that dealing with this guy has given me over the years. It's only because of, of the kindness and generosity and goodness of me that I have endured it for your sake. You're such a good person, Richard. Selfless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. As, as you know, Richard, as our viewers, most of our viewers know, we just wrapped up a great conference we had, one of the best conferences we've had on the national security state and the Kennedy assassination. If you haven't seen the videos in that, if you weren't able to participate, I invite you to view them. Like I say, I think it's a case closed presentation on the Kennedy assassination. And the best thing to do is to start with video one uh, by Jim DeEugenio and then work your way progressively because I structured that that conference in a very uh, meticulous way so that it would follow in a logical order. But it was such a success, Richard, that we are now, we want to do it again. We want to have another Zoom conference. Um, we think it really makes it easy for people and less expensive for people as compared to an in-person conference. I mean, I know you, you miss some of the dynamics of an in-person conference of interacting with people and so forth. But it, but the upside is, is that more people can participate in a Zoom conference. It's not expensive. People don't have to pay for travel, flights, hotel, meals, and so forth. So we want to do it again. And this time we want to do it on civil liberties. Uh, we've sent out a fundraising letter to um, all of our subscribers and supporters, and we hope we you give us your positive consideration on this. You know, Richard, we've been addressing civil liberties since our inception uh, at FFF. You were the vice president of academic affairs, and uh, I forget exactly which issue in 1990, uh, July, August, I forget, but it was de entirely devoted to civil liberties. And I remember the title of my article was The Forgotten Importance of Civil Liberties. Um, th this is absolutely a prerequisite to a free society. Now, 
I think most libertarians get into the movement with economics. They discover Austrian economics or they, they realize that, that what we're going through today with out of control spending and debt and taxation is not a good thing. And they discover Austrian economics. And I'd, I'd venture to say that my guess would be most people discover libertarianism through economics. But that's not enough. Uh, in order to get, achieve a free society, we need to restore liberties, uh, civil liberties. And so I thought, well, what we need to do is another conference. Now, we had two great conferences in 2007 and 2008 on civil liberties and foreign policy because they're very related. You know, when you've got an interventionist foreign policy, you're inevitably going to have assaults on civil liberties uh, because the, the state's now having to keep you safe from all the dangers that they're inciting overseas, like terrorism and so forth. Um, and, and, and in war, civil liberties become a dead, dead letter, as you know. Um, and then we've got Guantanamo Bay that maybe we can discuss a little bit further down in the program. But that's what we want to do. We, we want to have another program. So we're asking your financial support for this. And so, Richard, let me hand it over to you. You know, what, why do you feel that civil liberties are so important to a, to a free society? Well, I think that they're important because, uh, as you were suggesting, a lot of people get into the free market, limited government perspective uh, for their concern about economics. And economic freedom is essential. Indeed, as I'll, I will argue in a second, if you'll allow me, uh, economic freedom is inseparable from civil liberties. But what does civil liberties mean? We know by many of the guarantees that are in the uh, Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of association, freedom of religion, uh, freedom to be secure in one's person and property, uh, 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 a, a, a swift and impartial uh, 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 judicial hearing, the uh, writ of habeas corpus, that is, that you must be brought before a judge and it has to be demonstrated there's justifiable reasons to believe that you may be guilty of a crime and to explain what the crime is uh, and uh, to hold you over for a trial or out on bail for until the trial is held. All of these are important things. And I think that that, that we tend to, to forget that liberty is, is, is indivisible. It, it is a tapestry that is woven together. Uh, what it, one can have nominally private property rights, but the government could, could restrict you what you can say, who you can associate with, what you can write, whether you'll have a freedom of worship. Though so you must have civil liberties as well. Now, if I can just mention this, you know, Jacob knows that I'm a big fan of dead economists. Um, the reason I like dead economists is they, of course, can't change their mind on me. But no, but um, seriously, uh, there's a lot of great thinkers of the past who have often been forgotten. One of them, which is not very well known, but was prominent in the uh, early and mid decades of the 20th century, was a British economist named Hartley Withers. Now, during the 1930s, with the rise of collectivism and totalitarian regimes, he wrote two books that appeared at the same time. One was called... Uh, Economic freedom and private property. Well, that was clear. But the companion volume, and in fact, it was an even longer book, was called Freedom and Tyranny. And that book was on the importance of civil liberties. There is no freedom unless we accept the idea that a person is secure to go about these activities that I mentioned, that is covered in our Bill of Rights, without the encroachments, restrictions, abolitions or prohibitions of the government. Uh, what, is it, what is it to say that you have private property? But if the government says, well, you have your private property, but we will dictate what you can print, what you can write, what you can say on a platform. And at the same point time, what, what value is it to say that if the government says, yeah, you can say whatever you want, you can write whatever you want, you can interact and associate with whoever you want, but we control all the printing presses. We control all the lecture and, and public uh, places to assemble. We, we, we control the movie theaters. We control, control the radio and the television. So civil liberties and, and economic freedom are one and the same, all growing out of the right of the individual to the self-ownership of himself and extension of that, those things which he produces with the efforts of his mind and his, and his, and his physical efforts or requires through having done such things through trade voluntarily and peaceful and honestly with others. So to my mind, it is crucially important 
uh, at a time especially like today, when, when, when there is so many totalitarian pressures and sentiments around us, cancel culture, uh, systemic racism theory, political correctness, identity politics, all of these are current ideas and ideologies in the air, which are taking advantage of freedoms of, of, of the press, of, of speech, of assembly, of association, to advocate ideas that would undermine those liberties if they themselves came successfully and uniformly to power. They would shut our mouths. They would tell us what words we could use, how we could address each other, what they would claim to know what, what the right history is for us not to be able to debate these things. It is a totalitarian philosophy. They wish to take away our civil liberties. And the way they take away our civil liberties will be combined to take away or reduce our property rights. They are one and indivisible, and we must defend both or we will have neither. Yeah, and if you if you look back historically, even in just somewhat recent history, if you look back at World War One, uh, they they were jailing people for criticizing the government, for questioning the war. Eugene Debs, they sentenced to several years in jail for questioning the the conscription. Yes. I mean, if if you can't if you can't question conscription, what kind of country is that? And that's the thing is that all you need now you can say, oh well, they're not jailing people for doing that today. Well, yeah, but wait till the right crisis. And once the right crisis comes along, if you haven't prepared for this, as we libertarians are doing, we're trying to prepare people for what a free society is, then everybody's going to just be like sheep. And as people are being led to jail, uh, nobody's going to be there protesting. It's going to be too late. And then you've got the whole war on terrorism. Remember what happened after 9-11 when they, they had the secret surveillance and the secret packs with the telecoms where they were disclosing confidential information uh, the the assassin state sponsored assassinations got ramped up. Um, these are these are all part and parcel of this interventionist foreign policy and the so called war on terrorism. And they they're already saying uh, Biden's saying they're going to turn the war on terrorism domestically. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, look at how they've waged it internationally. Uh, you know, b barging into people's houses and banging down their doors in these foreign countries that they've invaded. There's no such thing as search and seizure restrictions in these foreign countries that they've invaded. They're looking for terrorists. That's what they're saying they're going to bring to the United States. And so all you need is one major terrorist attack, and all of a sudden we're looking at the, the, here what, what they've been doing in foreign countries. Uh, John Brennan, uh, former CIA director, he even said – that libertarians are among the people that need to be targeted here. That, that he, he's essentially saying those of us that are challenging or questioning what they do need to be silenced. That's really what he's saying. Well, we're not going to be silenced. Uh, and if you look at what they've done in Guantanamo Bay, I mean, there's your model. I mean, if you want to know how the federal government acts without a bill of rights, without a constitution, because when they when they set up their torture and prison camp in Cuba, it was going to be a constitution free zone. They wanted no restrictions at all. And look what they've done with it. Torture. Uh, they've got a denial of due process, denial of right to counsel. They, they're monitoring attorney uh, client communications. Hearsay is admitted. Torture, evidence acquired by torture is admitted. There's a presumption of guilt. These are the kind of threats. And Richard, our ancestors understood this. I mean, you mentioned the Bill of Rights. The reason those people demanded the enactment of the Bill of Rights is they said the federal government will end up doing these kind of things if we don't make it real clear that we're restricting their power to do so. And so you've got the first two amendments like uh, free speech, freedom assembly, but there's gun rights too. I mean, that's that's an important civil liberty. And then you've got the fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth amendments that are procedural protections that need to be emphasized. This isn't what a lot of people think, oh, what government officials say, constitutional technicalities that let guilty people go free. This to, is this is to protect the innocent people that the government would come after, and our ancestors understood that. Yeah, if I could just add the... We don't always understand the historicity of these rights. For example, let's take rid of habeas corpus. That is, that, that, that an accused has to be brought within a very short period of time before a judge to justify having arrested him on suspicion of a real crime. Why did, how did that arise? Well, in England, the king used to want to fight wars. 
And to fight wars, you need money, right? You pay the soldiers, the, the weaponry, feeding them in the fields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he would turn to, to, to the, the lords of the manors, the barons, and he would, he would ask for them if they, if they would to contribute to the war. And they, some of them started saying no. And so the king would arrest them, right, into the Tower of London, and they would sit there rotting on his arbitrary authority for as long as they would refuse to accommodate and agree with him or have their own properties and possessions seized and still rotting in the prison. So there was this long battle in British history that, that, that a person could not be arrested without a proper arrest warrant. His property could not be seized or looked at without a search warrant. That he had to be justifiably accused of a legitimate crime, not just that the king is upset with him, and that he cannot just rot in prison, that he has to be brought before a judge where the, 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 the prosecutor presents preliminary evidence to suggest that this person may be the guilty party on the basis of immediate or, or initial evidence to justify holding him over for trial, and that the, he has a right to reasonable bail, as well as the speedy trial, while he's out on bail, if he is released on his on his own, you know, recognizance in that way. But the, but the thing is, is that these were hard-won rights that the king could not arbitrarily do these things to you. Now, at first, it was the barons, because that's where the money was, right? Everyone's poor, you have these wealthy lords of the matter, and the king wants some more of that money beyond his own. But eventually, over several generations, these rights percolated down, not just to the barons being protected from arrest and imprisonment in these arbitrary ways, but every Englishman. Do we want the government to just push our door down, take us away? Is that not the imagery we have about the, 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 the Soviet regime, right? The, the communist regime in the old Soviet Union, the knock on the door in the middle of the night, the secret police take you away. Your parents, your friends, your family don't know why or where you are or whether they'll ever see you again. And you disappear into the system of prisons or slave labor camps. Is that not our image, imagery of terror, tyranny? No rights of what have I, what crime have I committed? Why am I being viewed as a suspect? On what basis do you say I may be connected with this crime? When do I get to talk to my, my, my defense attorney? When do I? When am I presented to a judge for him to see whether it's legitimate or not? Okay, these are crucial, and if these are denied, liberty will not survive. Yeah, I'm glad you brought a habeas corpus. I mean, I, I heard once somebody refer to it as the linchpin of a free society. Uh, you can't have a free society if the government has the authority to take you into custody and keep you there indefinitely. Uh, and the great thing about habeas corpus is that somebody can come into court and, and the judge, re well, the judge actually commands the person, the, the, the custodian, you bring the prisoner into my court and you show cause why I should not release him. Or another way of putting it, charge him or release him. Uh, and uh, that was why it was called a linchpin of a free society. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, these these are not just pretty words that the that our founding fathers put down in the Bill of Rights. These are rights that have been carved out in centuries of resistance to the tyranny of their own government. Uh, people gave their lives in you know, resisting the tyranny of the king. Uh, the, the due process clause, that actually goes back to Magna Carta uh, in the year 1215. And uh, the, the judge, uh, the, the, the king would take people into custody, hold them indefinitely. Um, due process it came to mean notice and hearing that before you can take anybody's life away from him or his property away from him, you've got to present him with a formal notice of what, what the charge is. What's the reason you want to do this? And then you have to have a trial. Uh, and, and in our case, uh, um, it's got, it can be the jury trial of regular citizens because our ancestors, they didn't trust judges and tribunals. So they said, if you're going to take a person's property away from him or, your, or his life away from him, you accord him a jury trial of regular citizens. And that jury verdict is final. I mean, that's what's so amazing about this system is that let's say that the government wants to kill a guy um, 
and uh, go through this trial. The jury comes back in and says, not guilty. He walks out of that courtroom a free person. The government can't appeal the order. The judge can't reverse the order. That jury's verdict is final. That guy walks out a free, a free man. Now, is there any danger here? Well, of course there's danger. I mean, the, 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 our ancestors understood that the greatest threat to their liberty does not lie with some foreign regime or foreign terrorists or foreign this or foreign that. The greatest danger to our freedom and, and everybody's freedom is their own government. And that's why one of the big reasons they were against what's called standing armies. In other words, national security states, deep states, massive military industrial complex, CIA, NSA. If you had told the American people at the time uh, the Constitutional Convention was coming out with their recommendation that the Constitution was going to call into existence a national security state, they would have laughed. They would have said, not on, not on your life. We're not. They would have never approved this type of government that we live under today. Because look what they've done, Richard. The, the, the Fifth Amendment's clear. No person, not just no American citizen, shall be deprived of life without due process of law. They're assassinating people right and left. Uh, now, they happen to be foreigners, but the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to only to Americans. It applies to everyone. And they just ignore it. They're, they're taking people's lives without due process of law. They're taking away their liberty. Look, that's what Guantanamo about, indefinite detention, that even though you got habeas corpus there, yeah, it's resulted in the freedom of some people there, but you have people there that have been there for 10 years. Where is their speedy trial? Uh, in other words, it still is a constitution-free zone because of the power that the military and the CIA have. And anybody thinks that the NSA has been reined in, it's nonsense. This whole FISA court's a bunch of nonsense. Imagine, in a country that purports to be free, you've got a secret court that can't even reveal its opinions to, to the public. This is not what a free society is all about. And all you need, Richard, is one little spark uh, and, and a big crisis, and all bets are off. Then when they start turning inward, uh, nobody's protected from that type of thing. And that's why it's important that we continue emphasizing this critical importance of civil liberties to a free society. Yeah, if I can uh, talk about one other element of this. I know that many conservatives and some libertarians as well have been bothered by the apparent acts of censorship and blockage by Facebook or Google about what some people put up or want to say and to be honest, I'm, at, I'm often irritated by this, too, when you do a search, for instance. And I, I know people who have been either temporarily blocked by Facebook for some remark or phrase or way of stating something or something they put up as a mime, for instance. And, what, and I think too many of our, our conservative friends uh, too willingly then say, well, you know, they, they, they have to be regulated to stop this, or, the, or, or Facebook and Google have to be broken up, or this, that, and the other. These are dangerous avenues. Just because someone does something that you don't like or agree with doesn't mean that you should then turn to the government for them to be reined in or obligated to act with their private enterprise the way you want them to. That is a more dangerous road in the long run than, than things that, that Google as a private company or Facebook as a private company may choose to have their own standards, however ideologically biased their benchmarks may seem to you and to me, to, to re put them under the reign and control of the government. Because once you do so, you can never be assured that those in political power and the bureaucratic administrators who have been appointed by those politicians will always censor or not censor the way you want. It is a double-edged sword. It is better for there to be no censorship by government and to accept the fact that, you know, on what basis do you invite people into your house? People who are your friends or family members. And sometimes a family member irritates you and they don't get invited to a family party or dinner. It's it's a matter of private choice versus government dictation. And we must respect the civil liberties of even these companies, these communi communication and social media companies that sometimes irritate us, then fall into the trap of turning control over them into the hands of the state. Because the state always can be in the hands of someone 
you don't agree with rather than someone who will command the way you'd like them to. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I want to add a variation to it. I was absolutely revulsed when I saw uh, the Congress summoning these the heads of these social media groups to come and testify before Congress. I mean, that's just just a, an intimidation factor that you will get on the same pages we are in the government and you will do what we want you to do. I mean, the message was very subtle, but they all got it. And it would have been so nice to have these guys saying, we don't need to appear before you and justify anything to you. This is supposedly a free country. We can run our businesses the way we want. If we want to keep somebody off, that's our right, but it's none of your business. Instead, you had these major CEOs kowtowing and, and, you know, I can understand their position. The government can do bad things to you, but there you've got an example of where government has this power. It's very subtle of saying, you will do what we tell you to do or else. And the or else is IRS audits or regulatory shutdowns and so forth. Um, I also want to mention, Richard, the, the critical importance of gun rights uh, as part of the civil liberties. Uh, you know, we often talk about gun rights as the right to protect yourself from criminals and violent people. The idea being that when you establish gun control, murderers and rapists are not going to obey that law. I mean, that's just stupid. If they're not going to obey a murder law or a rape law, why are they going to obey a, a gun law, especially when they know everybody else is disarmed, the people they want to rape or disarm when they're not sure whether that person's armed and make, that might dissuade them. But in any event, people have a right to protect themselves. But really what we need to be talking about also in terms of the founding of the Second Amendment is the right to protect yourself from government. That, that this is a the fact that people are well armed in this country, and I, I think it's fantastic that that gun sales are still going through the roof ever since uh, Biden was elected. That this idea of that government's your greatest danger, and the well armed society tends to keep a government in check. That a government a, a nation where people are disarmed becomes obedient, becomes deferential. But a, a government that's armed becomes more independent, more willing to stand up against tyranny. And the government knows that. And it operates as a deterrent factor to would-be tyrants when they know that people are able to resist in the final analysis, not just with words, but with, uh, with bullets as well. I totally agree with you. These are all important, whether it be the, the particular rights of freedom of speech, the press, religion, assembly, or as you were saying, the procedural ones. Uh, no search without a warrant, no arrest without a warrant, uh, a speedy trial, a writ of habeas corpus, a um, uh, uh, trial by jury, the, the right of counsel. All of these are profoundly important to preserve a free society. Now, I, as, a, as a classical liberal libertarian, I, 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 I place high, if not crucial importance on, on property rights and free enterprise. But as I said towards the beginning, it's an interwoven tapestry of liberty, of which liberty takes many forms and facets. But if you deny or weaken one, you not only have problems there, but it tends to run the risk of spreading to the rest of them, and then freedom as a whole is lost. Okay, on that eloquent note, we'll wrap it up. Again, we're, we want to do another conference on civil liberties similar to our JFK assassination conference on Zoom with various speakers once a week. We found that formula was very handy for people. Uh, we'd love to have your mid-year support to help us get that thing going. And thank you very much for your support. And Richard, I greatly enjoyed the conversation as always. Look forward to talking to you next week. Until next time. Thanks for joining us, folks.